Time for your solo. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, glad everyone's here, especially visitors. If uh, you haven't been with us before, we appreciate you being here. We'd encourage you to come back anytime you can. Um, we'd like to get to know you, so stick a little around a little while after services. I um, want to encourage everyone to grab a bulletin. In the bulletin, there's always a list of those who are sick, um, both temporary and, and chronic issues that people have. They need to have constant prayer, cards, visits, phone calls, that kind of thing. Just a few highlights this morning. Carlene Brewer will be having knee replacement surgery on the 26th of June. Uh, Kraft Robertson broke his arm playing baseball. Uh, he was able to be casted instead of surgery, so that's good. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, the graduation tables in the back uh, for Rivers Kennan and Matthew Horton. Um, they're in the foyer with Bibles and a place to put cards. Um, this will be the last day to add anything to that, so if you haven't already, please uh, open that Bible, highlight your favorite scripture, uh, write in the cards, etc., uh, and do what you will there. This will be the last day to do that. There will be a baby shower for Bailey Ballard this afternoon at 4 p.m. Will and Bailey are having a baby girl, Mary Catherine. Uh, she'll be registered at Target, Cutie Patootie, and Amazon. On Monday the 22nd, uh, I, think it's this, I think it's tomorrow, right? Will be our last ladies class until the fall. Last ladies class till the fall tomorrow. Russ and Doris Carter will be hosting the Empty Nesters group at their home on Tuesday, May the 23rd at 6 p.m. Uh, it'll be pork roast, so you won't want to miss that one. Please utilize the sign-up sheet in the foyer. Um, their address uh, is 808 uh, Sylvan Hill Drive in Jonesboro. Uh, again, don't forget about the sign-up sheet in the back. This will be the last uh, empty nesters until after summer, until the fall, so uh, please take advantage of that and be there if you can. Uh, this Wednesday, May the 24th, uh, we'll be having a farewell party for the Gozes. Um, there'll be a cake and a Sunday bar. Hope everyone can make it there uh, that night and see them off as they uh, are moving to Mountain Home and, and starting their work there. Uh, it'd be a good time. They'd appreciate it if you can, if you can be there and, uh, and participate with them for that. Vacation Bible School is July 9th through the 12th. Uh, if you can help in any way, please reach out to the Longs as, as soon as possible as that's being planned and organized right now. There's also flyers in the back that you can give out to anybody, so grab some of those on your way out. Um, new class quarter starts June the 4th. Uh, there's still several slots that need to be filled. If you're able to teach, willing to teach, please uh, reach out to Tyler um, or this, like several of these of these other announcements and things are on the Facebook group. You can comment there and those will be seen as well. Um, this week, our, our end of, uh, or this month, our end of the month potluck Sunday evening service uh, will be canceled due to the holidays and people traveling for Memorial Day. So next week, there will be no uh, potluck and, and evening service. So uh, just get ready for that for next month. I've got a couple cards to read, uh, thank you cards. One of them says, uh, we want to thank you so much for the time, uh, for the beautiful flower arrangement for my mother. I also want to thank those of you who supported us during the very difficult time by calling, texting, visiting us, or supporting us at the funeral. Uh, we also want to thank all of you that have prayed for us and that will continue to pray for us during this difficult time. That's Love, Alan and Missy Gossett. There's another one up here, it says, from Pat Skinner, uh, thank you all for the prayers and calls. Is there anything else that needs to be announced or said before we get started this morning? If not, our song leader this morning will be Daniel Rickman. Opening prayer will be led by Steve Boyd. Children's time is at Goza. Uh, scripture reading will be Bill Farley. Lord's Supper prayer will be Bill Ballard and closing prayer will be Jackson Ballard. Uh, at this time, I want to encourage you to get your minds focused and we will start our worship service with a prayer.
Will you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you for the many blessings that you give us. We thank you for Chase and Jamie for the work that they do here for all of us. We pray that you'll be with the ones that's suffering from any injuries or any upcoming surgeries that may be com coming about. We pray that you'll be with the, our soldiers around the world, be with their families, comfort them as only you can. We thank you for your son who died on the cross for us. We pray that you'll continue to guide us and protect us and hold us in your mighty hands. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, his Son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration, and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. 
Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Before the kids come up, just one second, if you don't mind, please, because I think this will be the last time, at least for a little bit, till we come back and visit, that me and Lindsay and my family will be with everybody like this together. And I just want to say thank you so much. I'm not going to make this about me. We're here for God. God Almighty, that lives through us, that works through us for his glory. But I would be mistaken and very sad if I didn't say that every one of you have meant so much to us. We've been with Grace Point for a very long time. Uh, you have been with us, some of you at our very wedding, some with some of our, our funerals with our families. Uh, you've always been there. Many of you have helped to teach my kids just something like this. How to, serve, how to serve God, how to obey God. And for that, I am eternally grateful. And though this is hard, I'm also very excited because God has chosen us, I have no doubt, to try to go up and spread his word elsewhere. And I would greatly appreciate all of your prayers for Lindsay and my family as we get ready to go to spread God's kingdom. But i also like to take this time before the kids come up to pray for you, Grace Point specifically if you don't mind, so please bow with me as we go to our Holy Father in prayer. God, only you know what's in my heart right now and how to better articulate it. I love this group of people so much, and I pray, Father, that you will put your hand on them, that you will look into their hearts, and that you will see that it's a people that does love you very much, as I love them. Lindsay and I have been so blessed to be a part of this congregation, and though you're calling us away to do something more, Father, I ask that as we're leaving this place that you will be with them, that you will watch over them, Father, that your spirit will consume them, will overfill them, and that they will be so joyful to sacrifice everything, Father, for your will. Just the simple things like yesterday, just having this community outreach, just the love they have, I pray, Father, you just simply, you just bless them like you always have, but bless them, Father, richly, that they may continue to do your goodwill in this community, that they may continue to be a beacon in this city that shows your love and your glory, that you are the only way to true happiness, that one day you're going to come back and take us home. Father, finally, blessed be you, Almighty God, who has even given us the chance to come here and feel these emotions. Because without you, we would just be flinging ourselves towards our own desires. We would be lost and hopeless, but you give us hope. And we pray that, Lord Jesus, you come quickly. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Children's time. Come on up. We do have a few visitors in the audience. Thank you, buddy. This is our children's time here at Grace Point. It's a time where we take just a few moments just to come together and to get on the kids' levels, which is, I like to say, my level. It's the fun level, in my opinion, but to teach them how to love Christ better, to serve God, to fear God and obey. This is something that I know that Grace Point will continue to do because they, they have a desire to instill this in their children. So bear with us a few moments as we have a little discussion. And Bo, you're going to come help me in a second because he just begged me and begged me and begged me. And this is the first children's time I've done in a long time. So you're finally going to help me, buddy, okay? But first, we're going to pray. Here, go. There you go. First, we're going to ask God to bless this gift because everything that they give goes to the kids in the community to help them in whatever need, okay? So everybody bow your heads. I want you to repeat after me, and afterwards, I want you to stay where you are, okay? Say, dear God. Dear God. Oh, come on. You do better than that. Say, dear God. Dear God. We love you. We love you. Bless this gift. Bless this gift. That, it may help that it may help other kids, other kids. like me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Bo, come up here, buddy. He says, please don't make me talk or anything. I'm not going to do that to you, okay? 
Bo, what I want you to do, though, it's not in the pocket. What I want you to do, though, Bo, Bo's a big kid, isn't he? Yeah, yeah he's a big. Bo, why don't you do some poses for us? Yeah, come on, stretch it out of here. You said you wanted to help. Come on, buddy. All right, so look at these muscles right here. See how big and strong they are? How do you think he got that way? Did he get this way from not eating anything? Or did he get this way from eating all his food and exercising and playing ball? Yeah, he got it from that. So what happens if Bo stops eating food? He'll starve. He'll starve. What will happen to these muscles right here? They'll go itty bitty puny. Yeah. What will happen to his, like his energy? You know, he bounces around. He's running around all the time with Ethan. What would happen? He won't. He'll be tired. He'll slump over like this when we slump over. Oh, <laughs> he'll eventually fall, fall over. He'll do that, but he won't flex. He'll eventually fall over. So what if, I, what if I had this right here? Now, this is courtesy of Mr. Chase. This is his idea, and I like it a lot. What's this right here, y'all? Fruit snacks. A lot of y'all know what these are, don't you? A lot of y'all are licking your lips right now, looking at it. This is nourishment, isn't it? If Bo eats this, would it give him energy? Yes. yes, it would. What if I said, Bo, take this. Here you go. You got nourishment. Is that going to help Bo? No. No, what does he have to do to get the nourishment? Yeah. How does he eat it, though? What does he have to do? Open He's got to open it first. Go ahead, Bo, open it. Come on, I just bragged about your muscles. Come on, man. He's going to try to pop it here. <laughs> His hands are sweaty, he says. Okay, so what if he opens it and eats it? Will he get nourishment then? Yes. Yes or no? Yes. yes, he will, of course. So having it just wasn't enough, right? He had to do something with it. Is that right? Yes. Now listen. Thank you, Bob. Go sit down, okay? Mr. Chase, if you listen real hard today, okay, which I hope you do, he's going to talk about a verse that says, Faith without works is dead, okay? Now, this is a big topic that a lot of people don't understand, even the big people, okay? Here's what I want you to remember. Everybody look at me. Eyes on me. Eyes on me. Everything that God gives us is because he loves us. Jesus Christ came and died for our sins and now is up in heaven building us a home because he loves us, not because of what we've done, okay? However, he gives us his Holy Spirit, does he not? Yes. What happens if we never pray to God? Do you think we'll be big and strong in our faith? What happens if we never read our Bibles? Do you think we'll be big and strong? What happens if we never tell anybody about Jesus Christ and how much he loves them? Do we be big and strong? No. No. Okay, everybody come down here on your knees with me, okay? I want you all to repeat something for me, okay? You hear me? Everybody look at me. I want you to repeat after me. I want you to say, salvation, salvation is, a gift. is a gift. Say it again. Salvation, salvation is, a is a gift. Very good. Very good. But when God gives us something precious, like the Word of God, when He gives us something precious like salvation, it would be wrong not to share it. It would be wrong not to get nourishment from it, right? And sometimes we have to go out there and do hard things. But I love you guys very much. I know you got some good people here that's going to watch out for you. But always remember one thing. God loves you more than anybody else ever could. And he's working through you every single day. So go out there every single day. Pray to God. Sing to God. And I want you to tell everybody you come in contact with. Jesus Christ loves them too, okay? Bow your heads. I'm going to pray. We're going to go back and sing a song, okay? Father God, you are so wonderful and so good. I specifically now, Father, pray for these little children right here. These children who are so, so great, so silly, yet they love you with all their hearts. I want to thank you for those that watch after them, whether it be parents, grandparents, guardians, whoever it might be. Watch over them, Father. Protect them from evil. Help us as those that watch over them to always be on our best example, Father. To always love you. That way they can see just what it means to be a Christian, the sacrifice, and how that sacrifice is so, so worth it, Father. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Go on back. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. 
They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. As the deer thirsts for the water, Lord, so my soul longs after you. My soul thirsts for the living God. Yes, my soul longs after you. And I pour out my soul deep within me. Deep within me, I pour out my soul. Draw me deeper, Lord, Deeper, Lord, in you. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. As the deer thirst for the water, Lord, so my soul longs after you. My soul thirsts for the living God. Yes, my soul longs after you. And I pour out my soul deep within me, deep within me. I pour out my soul. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. And I pour out my soul deep within me. Deep within me, I pour out my soul. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. Draw me deeper, Lord, deeper, Lord, in you. As we sing this song, you know, this, this song before the Lord's Supper, you know, start thinking about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by even averted their gaze from the sight. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spoke not a word, but chose to be silent, though you did no wrong, nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come, yet by your suffering our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high. Jesus, the name above all names. God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high. Jesus, the name above all names. 
you were despised. You were rejected, Lord, those who passed by, even averted their gaze from the sight. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spoke not a word, but chose to be silent, though you did no wrong nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come, yet by your suffering our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name, he has enthroned you on high, Jesus, the name above all names. You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by, even averted their gaze from the sight. Such was the suffering you bore, for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day. We're thankful that we could gather here and surround your table. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for your son that you sent to this earth and he lived a perfect life and an example for us. And dear Lord, we're so thankful that he made the sacrifice on that cross. And dear Lord, as we partake of this loaf which, which represents his body on that cross, help us to take it in a manner that will be pleasing in your sight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again thanking you for the, your son who you sent to this earth. Dear Lord, we're so thankful that he was willing to make the sacrifice that he made. And dear Lord, as we take this fruit of the vine which represents his blood, that through him we might have remission of sins. Help our minds go back to that time and to remember the sacrifice. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now thanking you for all the er many earthly blessings you've given us. And dear Lord, we're so thankful for those blessings. And dear Lord, as we give back a portion that you've so richly blessed, blessed us with, help us to do it with a loving, cheerful heart. Dear Lord, we just ask that you be with the elders and the deacons here at Grace Point as we use those funds and help us to do it in a manner that will be acceptable on your side. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all, ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saved you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saved you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball. To him all majesty ascribe, and crown him Lord of all. To him all majesty ascribe, and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall, we'll join the everlasting song and praise him. Lord of all, we'll join the everlasting song and praise him, Lord of all. If you'll please stand for this song and the scripture reading to follow. O oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. A shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilion in splendor, and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, 
how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. If you would, please turn with me to James, the second chapter. We'll be reading 14 through 17. James 2, 14 through 17. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Y'all settle in. It's such a good day to be with you today. Such a beautiful day. We had a beautiful day yesterday as well. If you were unable to come to our summer bash, that was a brainchild of Tyler Long and he and John and several other families did a lot of good work to put that together. Thank you for that. Precursor to VBS, inviting people out to VBS. There's flyers on the round table. Grab some, hand them out to friends and family. Get them ready for VBS. Uh, thank you, Tyler, for that day yesterday. If nothing else, it gave Jamie a really good sunburn. So I got something to mess with her about. I can slap her on the back or on the, on the shoulder right here. She'd love that if you did that to her. Zach, thank you for your words before children's time, brother. Uh, Bill's class this morning, we talked in uh, Corinthians about purging the evil from among you. So we're getting rid of the ghosts. Thank you for your comments during children's time. You and Lindsay, of course, we love you all to death. That children's time was perfect. I gave him a little idea. He, he ran with it. Love that. That's a perfect application of what we're looking at today. Hopefully you turn to James 2. That's where we'll be. And I don't know if this sermon will be longer. I was telling Bill Farley, I don't know if this sermon will be longer or shorter, but I did just recently have LASIK, and, and my eyes are healing still, so they're just blurry right now. And I do want to say a lot of you reached out and asked me how I was doing. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that so much. That really does mean a lot to me. I just should have typed my notes in 30 print font, and I didn't do that. So we'll see how I can manage. Uh, I, I Likely, uh, I'll get through it. But thank you for reaching out and checking on me. I love all you guys so dearly. We're talking about something that has been theologically debated, perhaps since creation. I don't know if Adam and Eve talked about salvation by faith or works, but at, right after them, I bet Cain and Abel and then from then on out began discussing this. This is a deeply discussed subject and it is one that we as the Church of Christ find ourselves in the midst of often because we, using the guidance of Scripture and the wisdom we see in it, we don't move away from the necessity of baptism. We line that directly up with someone's moment of salvation. Some throw stones at us and say that we preach a false gospel, that I am a false prophet, and that our salvation that we preach is works based. So as we get ready to read James 2, and I didn't plan on doing two sermons from James 2, but I just couldn't skip this passage because it's so theologically deep. It's so meaty for us to dissect and to chew on in our spiritual life. We've got to establish the frameworks of this entire lesson. So I'll ask for your answer here briefly, and then we'll get into it. Very easy question. I'll softball, I'll lob it up to you. Can we ever earn our way into heaven, yes or no? Is salvation works-based, yes or no? Does anyone disagree? Okay, now we've got that established. Why do they say the Church of Christ preached works-based salvation? None of us. I've never heard anyone say that. We only use the Scripture. We never use anything outside of Scripture. But some people have said very plainly, and this may reveal their heart to you, I wish James just wasn't in the Bible. I wish they just ripped out James. Because they preach that salvation is only by faith. They say it is only by internal belief or mental assent. And that is it. 
We say, well, there's works that come along with that faith. And even if you ripped out James, and I never would, I'm never going to be one that takes away from the word. Why did Jesus say, to please my Father, you've got to do what he commands. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. You can't be saved unless you do the will of my Father. Repent and be baptized. Okay, you want to get rid of Jesus' brother's words? What are you going to do with his? Jesus teaches the same things, but thankfully, James uh, has this lesson for us, and then next week, we'll apply James' teachings here in the life of Christ, in his teachings as well, as he will show us the necessity of the dual relationship between faith and works. We want to cultivate within ourselves a faith that produces good works. James will argue that true, genuine faith always produces good works. False faith or disingenuine faith, disingenuous faith, does not produce good works. But a true faith always produces good works. You will know them by their fruit. How can you be saved and not produce fruit and not produce good works? We see from Scripture, and I'm not being your judge, Scripture is, you can't be. Faith and works go together. So today we'll use James's lesson here about a faith that works. True faith is more than just a mere belief. It is a belief, but it goes beyond that. It is certainly more than a mental assent. I can't know if you're a faithful Christian or not unless I can see it in your life. And ultimately, I am not the judge, but James and Jesus, and even Paul, who writes so much about grace, shows us the importance of works as well. So we do not preach a works-based salvation. If you want, you could say we preach a both faith and work salvation because that's what Jesus preaches. Both are important, but ultimately, and you all agreed, and I'm not saying anything different, by grace through faith. There is no other way into heaven. I am not stealing the power away from God by saying that you must live faithfully. I'm not giving you more flowers than you deserve by saying you're a good enough Christian to earn your way into heaven. I am never saying that and will never say that. So please do not misunderstand me if I, I misspeak here at all. That's not my intention to mislead you. You cannot earn your way into heaven. If anyone tells you you can, they're wrong. But you do have to do something. If God gives you fruit snacks and says, eat and be filled, and you, rem and you leave the package closed as Bo did, well, I've got sweaty hands, God, I can't open it, whatever your excuse is. What do you imagine the Father's going to feel when you say, oh, I'm filled and you've not eaten? He gave you instructions. If God gives us instructions, are we to ignore them and say we are filled and say we are saved? Or are we, like good sons and daughters, required to follow the instructions? Which does a father favor? The son that says, I will go to the field and doesn't? Or the son that says, I won't go to the field, but later does? There's something important about the doing of faith that we all must have in our own life. So let's get into it here. I'm starting to go long. Faith and works go together. This we'll see from our section that we use for our scripture reading, James 2, 14 through 17. A lot of people spend way too much time separating faith and works. And they say Paul emphasizes faith and grace, and James emphasizes works alone. Neither man does either of those things. They both put faith and works together. James does not favor works instead of faith. He certainly does not replace faith with works. But he has, he has gathered and observed that some Christians, with the knowledge of their own grace, have become lazy or lame Christians and have then therefore done nothing for the church. So now James writes a scolding letter to the Christians saying, why aren't you working? Why aren't you living the faithful life that Christians are expected to live? And then people blow it up out of context and they say James is writing a different gospel. 
We don't need lame Christians in the church or lazy Christians in the church. We are all ultimately saved by the grace of God. But if you're really saved by the grace of God, aren't you going to tell somebody about it? Aren't you going to do something with that? Or are you just going to wait underneath the clouds until Jesus comes down? You, with a genuine faith, are expected to do something. Faith is evidenced by the actions that flow from a transformed heart. That's, we have a renewed mind, a renewed spirit, a new mind put in us by God. If we use that, good works will flow from that transformed heart. Let's see verses 14 through 17 again. James speaks very plainly about this. Don't rest the authority on me. Turn to the scriptures. What does James say? James very plainly says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith that does not work save him? Then he gives this example. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, just like that example, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And he'll repeat himself later, and we'll see this point again. But the analogy James uses is perfect here. It is very good and very polite for you and I, if we ever encounter anyone who is hungry or cold, to say to them, I love you so much, I want peace in your life, I want warmth in your life, I want a full belly in your life. That's always going to be a good thing to do. But how cold-hearted are we as Christians when we say, go and be well, when we have the very essence of life at our disposal, let alone a jacket, let alone a gift card to McDonald's, we can fill people's belly. We can give them warmth. We're called to do that, but we have the life-saving gospel. And instead, some Christians, as James exemplifies here, simply say, go and be well. You're good enough as you are. Just believe. James says, what good is that? Can that faith that does not work save the man? Is this the picture of the loving Christian that you would have us believe? Church that James is writing to? It's a Christian that works that James expects to see because he saw it in his brother Jesus and Jesus got the message from God the Father. True faith compels us to love. If you don't love your neighbor and love, wives tell your husbands, is more than just a word. It's an action, right? Gifts of service, physical touch, I need to receive love, not just feel it. If your love does not work, do you really love your fellow man? Do you really want people to not go to hell if you're not willing to work for them? Inspired by your transformed heart, filled with the power that you have received from the grace of God. It's always from Him. But that inspires us to go out. It is not enough to feel like you believe or to think you believe. That's step one, and it is essential, but it must take you further. Feeling like you believe is not enough. I'm not saying this. The churches of Christ don't have a secret meeting where we get together and they say this. Scripture says this. It's not a different gospel, it is the gospel. Our faith and works go hand in hand. And that's what we see, secondly, as we continue reading the writings of James, we see that faith is completed or perfected or fulfilled by works. They go hand in hand, but one is evidenced by the other. You can work without faith, but you cannot have faith and not have works the proper order of things. You can go through the motions and be a pew packer and not go to heaven. But you cannot be a genuine Christian and skip out on everything. James tests your faith. He calls your faith into question. Are you really a true believer who has true faith if you don't have the works that accompany the that everyone with a sensibility expects to find and expects to James says you don't. 
Genuine faith is a living force that is dynamic and active in our daily lives. It is not dead. Faith and works are companions working together to form an authentic Christian life, an authentic Christian individual. They work together. You've heard of a dumbwaiter analogy? A platform with two ropes? You pull one, you tilt everything to the side, you pull them both, everything goes up. Faith and works go together. I believe, therefore I do. Some say that belief is implanted in us and that's why we do what we do. The working of the Spirit touches us and that pushes us forward or or marionettes us, puppeteers us to do good works. James doesn't say that. Jesus doesn't say that. James says your true faith inspires your works. But if you don't have works, your faith is incomplete. It's missing something. Moving forward is the goal. Our actions move our faith forward. It puts feet on our faith. You may have heard that expression before. Look at what James writes as he continues. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. He says some scary stuff here. You do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And... The Scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. He gives another example. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And is it not the same way? Was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Abraham... The father of the faith, the great hero that James' audience would have loved so much, and Rahab the prostitute. Their faith, each of them individually was justified, each of them by their own individual actions. Abraham's faith was called into question when God says, take that boy up the mountain and give him to me. Abraham had faith the entire time, but he didn't stay in the tent. I believe that God will deliver my son, so I don't need to go up to the mountain. Abraham walked. He got the wood. He loaded up the donkeys. He got some servants. He grabbed his son. We famously talk about the discussion that may or may not have happened between the two of them. He laid his boy out. He built the altar. He raised up the knife. If that's not faith that works, I don't know what is. God stopped him. Abraham had faith the entire time. But that faith had to be proven genuine. It had to be completed by his actions. And then God, knowing what Abraham was going to do, knowing that Abraham's faith was genuine, stops him, reveals himself, a ram shows up, kill the goat instead, don't kill the boy. I knew you could do it, but you needed to prove it to yourself. Your faith is genuine. Rahab, the prostitute, is held up in equal esteem by James here, at least as far as her faith is concerned. When she received the messengers from God and could have very easily ratted them out, after all, she's a prostitute, she's not the holiest or most righteous of women, she hid them away and helped them escape the city. Her faith inspired her actions the entire time when the guards pounded on the door, we're looking for these men. If you're hiding them, we're going to kill you too. She had faith that God would deliver her and deliver them. She lied. She hid them away. They escaped with their lives. Because of her faith? Or because of her works? Or because of both? Because of both! They go together and faith is completed by works. If Rahab simply had faith... Oh, God will deliver these two men. They're right there. Go try your best. We'd have two dead messengers on her rooftop. She acted on her faith. 
believing in God the entire time. James refers to Abraham and Rahab and says their faith lives on as a powerful testimony as to what trusting in God looks like. Trust in God when He asks you even the most ultimate of sacrifices. Trust in God even when your own life is at risk just for two messengers. And everyone will know Abraham was faithful. Rahab, she was faithful. I know that because I can see their works. Poor judges that we are, I can know that Abraham was accredited righteousness, the writer says. Rahab was faithful because of what they did. Both Abraham and Rahab's faith was proven genuine by their corresponding actions. I don't want to doubt their faith, and I don't want to doubt your faith, but if your faith does not produce corresponding actions, it's going to be very hard to convince me, let alone God, the ultimate judge, that your faith is genuine. That's all James is asserting here. Show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by my works. How can you know that I'm faithful? Look at how I raise my daughters, how I treat my wife, how I conduct myself, how I live. That's all you have to work on. You don't know my heart ultimately. God does ultimately. I'm ultimately saved by Him. But true faith produces works. Faith that works, finally, brings life. Very short passage here to conclude the section in James here. If genuine faith will produce works then a false faith does not produce works. James repeats himself to close this thought, speaking about faith that is living and faith that is dead. Look at verse 26. And listen to this example he uses. For as the body apart from the Spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. If the soul left my little flesh robot right now, and I crumpled like an empty sack of potatoes. That's how dead my faith would be if I didn't have works. The body and the soul are two completely different things. When we have funerals, we say, that's not the brother, that's not the sister, they've gone beyond. This is just the body that we have. The true self is the spirit. You would never look at a dead person whose spirit has left him or her and say that they're alive. You would never... Th- Look at a Christian without works and say that their faith is alive. That's what James is saying. It is as dead as it gets. Faith apart from works. He repeats himself. Is dead. He argues that true faith must produce works. James is asking his audience, and now us, as we read his words, to examine our faith. Are you alive or are you dead? It's an easy test. Because you have a, the rubric. You have the grading scale. The teacher left that out. It's an open book test. You want to know how you pass the test? Believe. Do something about it. We teach the steps of salvation. That's a part of it. That last one, living faithfully, is a big one. Faith that works is alive and dynamic. And that faith that is living bears witness to your trust in God and the trustworthiness of God. Why do you do the things you do? Why do you waste your weekends? Why do you go in the middle of the week to worship? Why do you go to a summer bash when you can just go somewhere else? Because I believe. That's why I do what I do. I'm not earning my way into heaven. I, among all of us, certainly am not good enough to save myself but I'm going to try my very best to please my Father. Because I believe He loves me, and I believe He loves you. That's what we're called to live. That's what we're called to share. That's what we're called to preach. James is not writing a separate gospel. We're going to see in a week as we apply this to the life of Christ, what Jesus teaches about faith and works. If you want to embody that idea in a man, that's Christ. If he said, Father, I believe that you will save mankind, but I don't want to go to the tree. His faith would be separated from his works. He went to the cross because he believed in the will of his Father. He enacted it for you and for me. 
Imagine if Jesus' faith was dead. He wouldn't be Jesus at that point. He'd be some other made-up kind of character. Faith and works is Jesus embodied. I can't even imagine Jesus without works. Without all of the incredible things He did. If He stayed in the tomb. If He didn't go on the cross. We would have no reason for being here today. But because His faith was alive and He did what He did for you and did what He did for me, we're here today to worship Him. Aren't you going to do your best to please your Father? Isn't your faith supposed to be alive and well? I can't know it unless I see it in you. You can't know it unless you see it in me. God ultimately is the judge. You will be judged according to the things you do in the flesh. Scripture says you need a faith that works. As believers, we're called to embrace the duality of faith and works. We're ultimately saved by grace through faith. Now, hopefully, you've seen today how James and the Bible defines faith. It's more than just belief. It's more than just confession. It's alive. It's living. It's a faith that works. If you lack that faith today, you can change your life. You can come to Jesus. You can give Him your old sinful self and He can wash your sins away. He can put old you to death so that your faith truly can be alive. You can know what the grace of God feels like. You can know what it means to be loved by God so that you can be inspired to share that with others. But if you have been saved and you just lost sight of that, you're not living out your faith need to be for your children, for your family, for your community. Pray for you. We can support you. If you need to be baptized, if you need the prayers of the church, please come while we stand and while we sing. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will while I am waiting yielded and still have thine own way Lord have thine own way search me and try me master today whiter than snow Lord wash me just now as in thy presence humbly I bow have thine own way Lord have thine own way hold o'er my being absolute sway fill with thy spirit till all shall see christ only always living in me jesus you're my firm foundation I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Oh, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. I have a living hope. I have a future. God has a plan for me, of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation, I know I can stand secure, Jesus, you're my firm foundation, I put my hope in your holy word. 
I put my hope in your holy word. Your word is faithful, mighty with power. God will deliver me of this I'm sure, of this I'm sure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I know I can stand secure. Oh, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and all the many blessings in it. Lord, I ask right now to be with the sick and the afflicted, Lord, and bring them back to your most wanted health. I ask that we take Brother Chase's lesson and apply it to our daily lives, Lord. And most of all, thank you for sending your son. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.